Hi, I'm Jonah Comstock, Editor-in-Chief at Pharma Forum. I'm here at ASCO 23 with Mark Reisenhower, President uh, at Estellas of... Uh, U.S. Commercial. U.S. Commercial. Yes. See, I was, we're pretty far into this conference at this point. My brain's a little bit mush. I don't know if you feel the same way. <laughs> I feel the same way, yes. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about what Estellas is here to talk about at uh, ASCO this year. What are your kind of top line, uh, what are the abstracts you're the most excited about? Sure, yeah, so um, at Stellis Oncology, we have uh, 15 abstracts here at the meeting, but the three that really stand out in terms of what we believe are impact to patients, um, potentially, the first is we have phase three data from our new investigational agent, Zolbituximab, uh, and this phase three data, it's called the GLOW trial, and it's Zolbituximab plus Hapox in first-line gastric cancer patients who are Claudin 18.2 positive and HER2 negative. Uh, and this is an investigational drug and this is one of two phase three programs uh, that have just completed. The other two uh, trials are actually from Infortimab Vidot, uh, or PADSET is the brand name. Uh, one trial is looking at uh, the first clinical data of an intravesical formulation uh, to be used in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, and this is a trial we do in partnership with Seattle Genetics, uh, which we have a collaboration with. And then the last uh, Infortimab trial is one looking at um, its single agent use in patients who were previously treated for head and neck cancer. So uh, for us, these are all exciting trials. And, and again, hopefully uh, can lead to significant impact for patients. All very different too, right? I mean, uh, the, the second one you mentioned, you said you're working with Sophia Genetics. Is, is that uh, gene therapy or is it... Yeah, so uh, Infortimab is an uh, antibody drug conjugate, and um, we're in a partnership with them. It's, uh, and actually, we've already launched for um, a later stage of bladder cancer, and most recently, we just had a new indication in the frontline setting in bladder cancer in combination with Keytruda uh, for patients who are ineligible for cisplatin. So, um, we're, we're very much involved in the ADC world right now, and um, I think we, we have the benefit of having a real uh, significant product in PADSET, but we have a lot of pipeline activity also looking at ADCs. Yeah, this has been such an interesting um, ASCO because of the sort of moment we're in in oncology care, uh, where you know some of these more recent developments like ADCs, like immunotherapies, are they're really they've kind of blossomed out to mm -hmm. applications in so many different cancers. Yes, um, and it's really like. Uh, sort of flourishing time, right? Mm -hmm. It really is. It really is. I So this is my 30th ASCO. Wow. And I started when I was an intern. No, I'm just kidding. But it has been 30 years. Uh, but I was very early in my career, not an intern though. But if I look back to, to your point about kind of what has happened, the explosion of science, whether it's ADCs, um, immunotherapy, immuno-oncology, um, the other one that we're also active in, targeted protein degradation. Uh, these are all new modalities that are having s significant impacts on patients and exciting to see all the data here. And what's been interesting to me from what I've seen so far is that these new modalities, in terms of how they interact with the old modalities, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that you balance safety and efficacy and, and mm -hmm. patient care and toxicity, um, or, or avoidance of toxicity, right? Uh, you know, this notion of like, wh what are the areas where these drugs can actually start to replace radiation and chemotherapy, mm -hmm. these harmful things, and when do we need to keep using them in conjunction? Yes. Uh, I mean, that to me is a really interesting kind of storyline we've seen, right? I, I would agree. And I think that's been, that's been the promise of these new modalities for many years. I think it's been slow progress, but I think we're getting there in terms of being able to do that. Um, and I think PADSEP is a great example of that, where um, it's being used in combination with pembrolizumab in the frontline um, bladder cancer area. And currently it's for patients who are cis ineligible, cisplatin ineligible, where there really aren't many options. But we also have an ongoing trial that compares pembro and PADSEP to an active chemotherapy mm. uh, regimen. Um, so we'll wait to see the results of that. But I agree. I think that is a very promising trend in general. But I think to your point there, finding drugs for patients who currently don't have any options is so important. And that's yes. another thing I've heard you know, a lot of is that like 
we are we're well beyond the low hanging fruit. We're investigating these kind of difficult areas that traditional therapies weren't able to crack, and now there are patients who have some hope for the first time ever, which is pretty pretty exciting when you put yourself in the shoes of those patients. Absolutely, yes, and that's literally that's our focus. We our focus at Estelle's Oncology is hard to treat cancers in areas where there are very few, if any, treatment options. Uh, and if you look across our portfolio, that's where our therapies come into play, whether that's acute myeloid leukemia, which is um, a rare uh, blood cancer, uh, whether it's head and neck, bladder, prostate. Um, and we, we spend a lot of um, our research efforts in that regard. And um, we have set up, um, interestingly, we have set up across the company five focus areas of where we invest our R&D. And over all of them, it's, it's the overarching, it's, it's hard to treat areas with high unmet need. In an oncology, we have two areas. So of the five, two of them are oncology. One is immuno-oncology and the other is targeted protein degradation, both of which are focusing on very hard to treat cancers. Um. I don't want to get too far down a rabbit hole, but I'm not as familiar with targeted protein degradation. Do you want to give me a quick overview? High level, yeah, I'll give you a high level on it. Um, and we're, it's relatively new for us. Um, so targeted protein degradation is a way to hit what were considered to be undruggable targets. So we know there are certain cancer targets that if we could get to them, likely you, know, you might have some efficacy, but it was hard to develop either a small molecule or a biologic against that for a variety of reasons. So targeted protein degradation is a way where we've been able to find out how to actually target um, these um, specific targets. And so for example, for us, the target is KRAS G12D. That's a very specific target. It's implicated in, in a couple of different cancers. Nobody can develop a target against it, just physically. Again, whether it's chemistry or biology, through targeted protein degradation, we found a way to do it, and we went entered into phase one trials June of last year, uh, and we accelerated that program to get into man quickly. And so we'll wait to see what the results are, but it's an ongoing trial right now. That's interesting. Is there any relationship to this and and targeted radiotherapy, or uh, slightly is, different? This yeah. is more of um, it's more of the mechanics of how you get a drug to yeah, actually yeah. hit a target. So I, I get what you mean. I would say the targeted radiotherapy is closer to an antibody drug conjugate yeah. concept. Yeah. Um, so I've been asking a lot of people uh, the same kind of question uh, about technology. Yes. Um, that's another thing that's changing right now in terms of digital technology and artificial intelligence is a big topic right mm -hmm. now. What are some of the ways you've seen that change how you do your work in oncology and how do you see it changing things more in the next five to 10 years? Mm. I would say from a technology point of view, you have you know some specific, you've got AI, you've got digital, et cetera. But what that is resulting in is faster development in areas that we already know are very promising. And I'll give an example. But if I, if I had to say, what are the three hottest areas in oncology right now? that is benefiting from some of this technology. It's the progress with antibody drug conjugates, immuno-oncology, targeted protein degradation. They'd be three All these the things top. that we've been describing as exploding right now, that's part of the reason. Right? That's part of it. It's benefiting from some of the specific technology. And so um, I, I think that's great for patients. I think you're seeing those advances move very quickly. Uh, and at Astellas, those are all areas we participate in as well um, and are making significant investments in. Any other overarching thoughts, um, trends you've noticed, uh, any, anything else you want to make sure you talk about in terms of, of yeah. what you're bringing? The one thing I would say is a, I would call it a negative trend, but it's something uh, I think it's important to highlight is in the U.S., um, we have the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed late last year. And one of the unintended consequences of that law is um, a provision around small molecules that will actually disincentivize research and development in mm. that area. And, and I'll explain. Um, the way the law works, if you're a small molecule, which is like a pill, think of it mostly as a pill, you have nine years on the market before your price will get set and get reduced down. In oncology, as an example, we have products that, where we've done this, it's incremental investments. You start with a trial in late stage cancer, 
you prove that you work, and then you move earlier and earlier in the disease to benefit more patients. But that takes time. And the, the challenge with only nine years, that is going to disincentivize a lot of research in small molecules in oncology. There's been a lot of companies who've actually already said we've terminated programs because we can't justify the investment. That's interesting because it's not, it's not, you're not developing one drug at a time in the way that sort of people might think. You're developing a drug and then you're developing new indications for it, new use cases, new combinations. Exactly, exactly. And there's, there's a statistic that if you look at um, oncology products that are on the market today, over 60% of them have, are, have indications that are different than what they started with, to your point. And our own example, we have a product for uh, advanced prostate cancer. It launched in 2012. So here we are 11 years later. We just released phase three trial results of yet another you know, potential ex indication expansion in earlier uh, high-risk prostate cancer. And in a post-IRA world, like if IRA was in place back then, you'd have to seriously consider whether you'd make that big investment. It was an eight-year trial. And can we afford to invest it? Because by the time we get the results, we, we can't recoup the benefit. So this, I would say, this is a negative trend impacting oncology in particular just because of the nature of drug development in oncology. Yeah. So all you can hope for at this point is that there'll be a reconsidering a modification of the way this law works. Th that's to, right. To I think wh the... what is being proposed, I think, by us and many other companies is um, move that to 13 years instead of nine. 13 is the amount of time that they've given for biologics mm. in the IRA. So we're saying just make it 13 to be comparable. 13 years actually is a that extra four years makes a big difference in being able to get to um, earlier stages of cancer patients. Well, I appreciate that insight. I've, I've obviously heard a lot about the IR. I've talked to a lot of folks about it, but I hadn't heard that particular. Um, you're, you're very good at explaining things, Mark. Okay, so I appreciate good. it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I hope you have a great show. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Well, thank you, Jonah. I appreciate your time.